Hello, everybody, and welcome. I hope you're all taking best care this evening. And for those who don't yet know me, my name is Nina, and I'm Curator of Programs and Interpretation at the Williams College Museum of Art. Before we begin, just a few technical notes. First, we anticipate this program will run a little over an hour. Also, a reminder that tonight's program will be recorded and be available on the museum's website in the coming weeks. Also, at any time throughout the program, if you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom navigation bar. We'll answer those at the end of the program. If you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to write to us in the chat at any time. This evening's program will be captioned with thanks to Terry Gibson, who is serving as our live captioner this evening. You can enable or disable these captions, adjust the size of the captions, or see the full transcript by clicking on the closed captions button at the bottom of your Zoom navigation bar. With that, I'm delighted that you can join us for tonight's conversation, Color and Pigment in South Asian Painting with scholars Gina Kim, Professor of Indian and South Asian Art at Harvard University, and Murad Muntaz, Assistant Professor of Art at Williams College. Professor Gina Kim's research explores a diverse range of topics, including female patronage and representation in Indian Buddhist art, materiality of text and image relationships, Indic art of the book, and appropriation and reappropriation of religious objects and sites in the post-colonial context. She is also the author of Garland of Visions, Color, Tantra, and Material History of Indian Painting. Professor Murad Mumtaz is both an accomplished scholar and an artist trained in the traditional art of North Indian painting, specifically the miniature tradition. In his scholarship, he examines historical intersections of art, literature, and religious expression in Southeast Asia. This semester, we're also delighted that he's teaching a studio art course at Williams College called Tasvir Khanna, Technique and Practice of Indian Drawing and Painting. Throughout the semester, students learn from studying original works of Indian art on display at the Williams College Museum of Art and by practicing these techniques themselves in the museum's galleries. Tonight, Professor Gina Kim will start us off with about 15 to 20 minutes of background context. Then she and Murad will come together in conversation before opening it up to audience questions. If you are interested in learning more about this topic or Murad's course, we encourage you to visit the museum's exhibition website and we'll share a link in the chat. Throughout the remainder of the semester, we'll also be posting a series of videos that go even more in depth to the techniques, practices, and processes of Indian painting. And with that, it is my absolute pressure, my absolute pleasure to turn it over to the wonderful Professor Gina Kim. Thank you all so much. So hi, thank you, Nina, for that introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak uh, with Professor Murad Muntaz. And, uh, Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. And uh, and it's, the course sounds just amazing. I wish I can take uh, one. Uh, let me just start sharing my screen. And I'd like to thank uh, the Williams College Museum of Art team, especially Nina uh, and, and uh, Keith and Terry who are sort of working behind the scene to make it such a smooth experience. So I'd like to start today's, uh, this evening's conversation by asking this simple question. How blue is the Hindu god, Krishna? This would be a fun art history quiz. See how many images you can locate from these details. I'll give you a moment to just like study it. I hope the slide is self-evident. These images depict Krishna in painting between 1425 and about 1800 common era. How blue is Krishna? These paintings depict Krishna blue, but how artists translated this color varied, sometimes even within a single manuscript. We should also acknowledge an obvious challenge here. Translating a color or discussing color values is notoriously difficult. These are digital images of the paintings that we're looking at. 
and our experience is mitigated by the artifice, the machine and the code that translate the color into what we see on the screen. So what you see on the screen is the color swatch for the website for my digital humanities project, the mapping color in history. And I don't know if, if you can even spot any differences between these two swatches on the screen. The web designer and I had back and forth messages about how purple should look more than purple or less blue perhaps, or blue needs to be a bit less turquoise-like. What does that even mean? Right, uh, And my son who was passing by when I'm trying to compare these uh, said, the difference, what, what are you looking at? They don't look, they look exactly the same. And you do notice the hex codes are actually uh, different for those two colors, blue and purple. I share this to show the difficulty of conveying the color values through language and how subjective color experience can be. Despite these semiotic challenges, a sustained analytical attention on color can offer new insights regarding the history of painting and the meaning and the function of color in art. Why do primary colors dominate the palette of South Asian painting? This is the central question I ask in my book, Garland of Visions, Color, Tantra, and the Material History of Indian Painting. My book explores how color emerged as a central tool to shape, structure, and circulate visual knowledge in pre-modern South Asia. It does so by looking at what Ananda Kumaraswamy, the first curator of Indian art in North America, once called the blank period in Indian painting with, quote, no one great religious inspiration. In Kumaraswamy's reckoning, this falls between 650 and 1427. He had a very specific period and dates in mind. And this period is what scholars studying religious tradition would now call the age of Tantra. And this is precisely where I find the key to answer the question of why the South Asian paintings look so colorful. Although color is often treated cursorily as one of the attributes in iconographic studies, it is not only symbolically meaningful, but is also the material link that can help unpack the constructive relationship between vision and art. So in the book's sixth chapter, I turn to explore what I call a material history of Indian painting, paying particular attention to understanding material compositions of colorants used in painting. I use pigments and colorants interchangeably, but colorants actually include dye stuffs. Identifying pigments in a historical object, like the one used um, in a 12th century Buddhist manuscript, like this one, and understanding them in a historical context require a deeply involved interdisciplinary collaboration and the pigment analysis data on which I build my historical analysis is all drawn from scientific material analysis done by conservation scientists and conservators as acknowledged in each slide. <clears throat> so before getting into details about pigments and historical changes in the painter's toolbox, let us briefly first consider the color terms and their meanings. Color terms begin to appear somewhat systematically in Sanskrit artistic treatises. So in the Natya Shastra uh, on the screen, a foundational text in Indian aesthetic theory, rasas or taste are categorized in color terms. So the erotic is blue black or shyama, the comic is white or sita, the tragic is gray, kaputa, and the violent red, Rakta, the heroic is golden, Gaura, the fearful black, Krishna, the Makabar blue, Nila, and the fantastic, fantastic yellow, Pita. This list is by no means systematic, and there may be psychosomatic reasons for assignment for specific colors to specific emotion driven rasas or taste in this treatise on drama. Sheldon Pollock's Translation, English translation renders the color terms straightforwardly. For example, shyama for shringara 
or the erotic is translated as blue black or Krishna for Paya, the fearful is translated as black while Nila for the Makabar is blue. Here it is important to note that Krishna and Nila, these two terms are differentiated in this early drama, dramaturgical text. The primary colors identified in the Chitra Sutra section of the Vishnu Tarimottara Purana, an important, important Vaishnava or Vishnu text uh, <clears throat> written down in Kashmir sometime between 450 to 650 common era, and in this text, um, it is also differentiated. I mean, it also differentiates between Krishna and Nila. The five primary colors for painterly practices, according to the Sutra Sutra, are white, yellow, red, blue, and black. Although they say their colors are in hundreds. Um, it is justifiable to translate the term Krishna as black in contrast to blue of Nila. But what optical values that this Krishna or Nila would have meant at the time of the text composition and throughout the first millennium remains challenging to determine. In today's popular visual culture, Vishnu is dominantly depicted in blue, along with his two most revered human incarnations, Rama and Krishna. The fixation of blue color for Vishnu and his human incarnations may in fact relate to the understanding of the term Krishna as blue, which was most likely shaped by artistic interventions. It is also unclear exactly when Krishna's blue color became an attribute as, of, uh, as few paintings depicting Vaishnava iconography from the period before 1400 survive. But blue is one of the colors given to different forms of Vishnu in this Nepalese manuscript of the Vishnu Dharma, dated 1090. And in the center of the seven forms of Vishnu is a Vishnu in blue. And in 12th century Buddhist manuscripts from Eastern India, where we see the Buddha being greeted by Hindu God, Vishnu is almost always blue. There is one Nepalese uh, example, it looks uh, more like green, but that's for another day. Although it is often assumed that early South Asian manuscript painters use ultramarine blue, the precious pigment made from the gemstone lapis lazuli, partly based on its known usage in the fifth century murals of Ajanta, this doesn't seem to have been the case. We have very little baseline data for pigments used in painting in medieval South Asia, especially for the period before 1500. And this is why I have been collaborating with the colleagues at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and the Harvard Art Museums to conduct more scientific material analysis of pigments in South Asian painting. And the data that I have, been seen so, uh, I have seen so far suggests that the manuscript painters of pre 15th uh, century use organic blue, most likely indigo. And here it said that blue uh, horse actually, this data suggests it's uh, gotta be organic. And the same goes for this Jane manuscript from uh, 1260, uh, that the blue here is going to be also organic. I'm happy to explain this chart later if anyone wants to learn how to read these things. Uh, Anyway, so it was most likely indigo. The use of ultramarine is known in this on cloth dated 1451. Sorry, this painting on cloth dated 1451, this Priya Vasanta Vilasa. And the famous, this first Bhagavata Purana uh, used ultramarine for Krishna. The introduction of ultramarine didn't mean that indigo was replaced though. Indigo remain in use alongside ultramarine in both examples. So diversifying the palette in the 1450 uh, Basanta Vilasa on the left. Um, so bright blue on this is ultramarine and the darker blue transparent, uh, sort of darker but transparent blue would be indigo. This reading is from an early 1960s study and it would be excellent if this painting was re-examined 
as Gettins, uh, Waterford Gettins, uh, suggests indigo as a strong possibility, but he also said further analysis is necessary to confirm. And there are a lot more analytical techniques that are now used, uh, non-invasive analysis technique that can actually help us uh, identify the pigment more precisely. And in the case of the Harvard folio of the dispersed Bhagavata Purana of the 1520s to 1540s, the visible blue is ultramarine, but indigo use is confirmed on the green of the tree, especially. And interestingly, the underdrawing, which is visible due to the loss on certain areas here, is also uh, done in indigo, which is actually a surprising use of indigo. And, and they, these underdrawings disappear under the IR photography. So, which actually indicates this was organic rather than sort of carbon black or uh, any other earth uh, pigments. <clears throat> and from the same series, Dr. Kathy Aramin uh, and her team at the Harvard Art Museums also reported finding a mixture of ultramarine and indigo for some blue areas in at least one folio. So these findings of different pigments being used for the same color creating different color expressions suggests the unnamed artist agency in choosing their pigments and diversifying color, shaping our color experience. The use of mineral pigments like ultramarine and azurite for blue certainly would have inspired enduring poetic imagination around the blue color of Krishna. The off-sided opening couplet or doha of the Satsai by Bihari Lal uses colorist terms to poeticize the impact of Krishna's be beloved Radha. In the second half of this first hemisphere, coming in contact with her shadow turns his dark color, Shama, into a greenish brightness. In an early 20th century Hindi commentary, Ram Vriksh Benipur explains the poet's clever usage of color terms as suggesting the mixture of two colors blue, nila of Krishna, and golden yellow, kanchana of Radha. It is perhaps no surprise that the poet capitalized the color chemistry to capture the image of the devotee's union with the divine, central to the Krishna bhakti movements. Being a court poet, Bihari Lal may have been familiar with painterly practices. In fact, Bihari's use of the term Shana instead of Nila or even Krishna takes on an interesting artistical significance when considered together with the painted images of Krishna that appear in the now dispersed illustrated manuscript of the Rasika Priya, the so-called Boston Rasika Priya. Krishna in this manuscript is consistently portrayed in darker skin color than everyone else in each scene at times appearing kind of grayish, but never in blue. This convention is similar to the painterly strategy of rendering Rama and Rama's skin tone in the Freya Ramayana and other imperial Mughal, Mughal in illustrated manuscripts of the Hindu epics in Persian. So in the Freya Ramayana manuscript, the artist rendered Rama in various dark shades from light bluish gray to gray and this may be an attempt to render Rama as uh, recorded in the text whose body color is described in the Ramayana text as Shama. And different artists working on the same manuscript seem to have interpreted this dark monsoon cloud-like color differently while rendering Vishnu as in brilliant blue without agitation. So you see uh, Vishnu here, and these are different sort of rendering of Rama. On the other hand, um, the, in the famed Jagasing Ramayana manuscript, there is no hesitation in depicting Rama as brilliant blue, most likely mineral blue like lapis lazuli or azurite instead of organic blue like indigo. And I'm waiting on an analysis uh, being done on, on one of these folios in the CSMVS in Mumbai. <clears throat> we'll see what uh, that blue is. Although we cannot prove that the poet Bihari had access to the Boston Rasika Priya at the court of Rajajai Singh of Ember, 
Mughal imperial painterly interventions initially pictorialized Shama in this dark monsoon cloud-like color of Rama. Bihari's poetic talent was first appreciated at the Mughal imperial court before his career as a court poet under Jay Singh, who was one of the closest Hindu allies of the Mughal empire. The Mughal inspired paint painterly translation of Krishna and Shama may have shaped Bihari's understanding of Krishna's color. But unlike the idea of blue, a primary color, this dark skin color, as we see in the Boston Rasika Priya pages, is difficult to describe or convey. This is perhaps why its occurrence seems to be limited to courtly circles that were in intimate contact with the Mughal imperial court and its painting workshops. By the time Bihari Lal composed his couplet, painters familiar with the Indic manuscript tradition had introduced various brilliant hues for Krishna, painting him in deep blue with pigments like ultramarine and azurite. Some began to experiment with other pigments like smalt, and some groups also went back to creating much darker blue-black that the term Krishna seemed to have been initially associated with in the Indic manuscript tradition, reportedly by com combining indigo with other pigments like smalt and red lock. And this recipe is known from the Pichvai painters of, um, in uh, Rajasthan, in Natwara. So here in this painting from Bundi, Rajasthan of the mid 17th century, the colors are brilliant and jewel-like. And when you see this in person, it really does feel like it's a sort of anop like jewel. The blue here is smalt, a pigment that's believed to have been imported from Europe in the 17th century, although we may in fact have some evidence of earlier usage in South Asia before the European factories began to produce them commercially and uh, it got traded to sort of elsewhere. Along with smalt, it also uses pigments that are not seen in earlier paintings, such as atacamite, Indian yellow, red lead, while these new pigments were being embraced in some Rasput courts of the 17th century, this didn't bring on a wholesale shift in pigment usage in the subcontinent. For example, in this Ramayana painting from Malwa in West Central India, further to the south and the east of the area of Bundi, where that other painting was from, we find pigments that are common with those used in, let's say, the 12th century Buddhist manuscripts. So the basic color scheme in its saturation do not seem too far from each other on the surface when you look at these two paintings side by side. And even the choice of blue for Vishnu's human, human incarnations, one Krishna, the other one Rama, is sort of uh, the same. They use wildly different pigments. Along with smalt, the Bundi painting uses Indian yellow, that famous pigment that is believed to have been prepared from the urine of cow fed on a diet of mango leaves. So why are their material compositions so different? Perhaps it is because Wundi painting is about a generation later than Malwa one. Or perhaps even more likely, it is that each court's geopolitical situation determined the access to new types of pigments and pure painterly knowledge. How and why did these changes? Uh, how and why did these changes happen? What impacted color choices in each instance? By identifying pigments used in early Indic manuscript paintings and by historically analyzing the scientific findings, we can trace the history of artistic interventions that cleverly combined old concepts and newly available materials to formulate colorants. Painting condition the way color was imagined and experienced in each community. If we start mapping the appearance of pigments geographically and chronologically, the ensuing color map can help understand the, understand the locally specific understanding of painterly practices. And this is also why I'm pursuing this collaborative digital humanities research project, Mapping Color in History, which I'm, I'm happy to talk more about uh, with Murad. So before I end my portion of this evening's, evening's program, 
I would like to share just a tiny bit more about uh, what I have learned from working with conservation specialists and observing contemporary artists. One thing that fascinates a lot of people is this pigment Indian yellow. The pigment whose known recipe calls for the use of urine of cows fed on an exclusive diet of mango leaves. This usage of cattle urine has also been confirmed in recent scientific material analysis. It is definitely animal origin with urine element, eusentic acid. And it is indeed such brilliant yellow, such a brilliant yellow, and is reflective under UV which under the normal sunlight would have made, made the painting look even more brilliant. And here is how it looks uh, under UV light in a lab setting. So this is a Boston, Boston Rasika Priya page. Uh, and you notice the skirt of uh, the, the female figure here is not as brilliant, but you know that actually had Indian yellow underneath that it's so quite reflective and brilliant. <clears throat> So the painting on the left is in the National Museum of New Delhi and the, the, their label had it like, you know, sort of production of in, uh, Indian yellow. I'm not quite sure what to make of this painting yet. Uh, and I need to sort of uh, learn more about this painting. And I believe it's a very late painting, uh, but, I, but some scholars have doubted the sole known uh, eyewitness report by Mukherjee about observing the pigments being crafted using cattle urine in the Mongar district of Bihar. Whatever the actual origin, what I've observed in visiting contemporary village artists in Bengal and Orisha, where natural materials around the area get cleverly used for painting materials, I cannot but wonder about the tantalizing possibility that someone in South Asia sort of in, at some point, accidentally seeing this dried up urine or cattle matter being so brilliantly yellow and finding a way to use it for painting. And I'm also very grateful for Murat to demonstrating different aspects of painterly practices, which change the way I understand the, I understand the findings in historical materials. So I will end my remarks here and turn to Murat to continue our conversation about color and pigments with Dick. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina, this for your wonderful talk. And uh, I have so many uh, questions and thoughts. And um, I uh, just recently, literally a few, day or two ago, I got uh, finally got your book, and I was just sort of perusing through it. And uh, in in so many ways, it's such an eye opener, particularly for my own practice. Also, um, I mean, because so many ideas and I think it might be also true in so many uh, family-based workshops uh, in India as well that so much, many of the techniques that we are taught are taught as if they are sort of absolutely hermetically sealed uh, that that's how blue is made you know that sort of thing and uh, it seems like so much of your research is in a way not only questioning it but actually proving it scientifically that um, <laughs> there they aren't these sort of rigid demarcations and for me that has been extremely helpful and that also uh, has I think it contributes to our field as well by challenging certain historiographical uh, trends uh, like you know specific categories as you mentioned between uh, you know the mountain region and Rajasthan or even Tibet and interactions with those regions uh, for me is also extremely fascinating. Um, so uh, yes, I have a lot of questions. Should I? Uh, <laughs> sure, yeah, no, no. Uh, First up, uh, what sort of uh, scientific methods did you, I mean, if you want to talk about a little bit more about the methods mm -hmm. that uh, the people that have been helping you uh, have, or you have been collaborating with, uh, what sort of methods have they been using specifically for these? So th these, um, again, um, a lot of the analysis that's being done now is non-invasive. So prior to, let's say about 2000, um, you know, even just like less than a generation ago, I think it was harder to identify pigments uh, without taking samples. You just had to take samples to do a lot of analysis. And what I was referring to on Freer Vasanta Vilasa, 
uh, painting, that cloth painting of uh, 1451 in the Freer Zeckler Gallery. That, that one actually was only microscopic and also microchemical analysis. I think that means he had to take some samples. So that was done in 1961. So that analysis didn't have a lot of sort of non-destructive, uh, non-invasive sort of methods. Whereas these days we do have a lot of tools that actually use these imaging and radiation or sort of light waves to um, identify pigments. I actually have a slide that I can show you. Um, you don't yes, please. I mean, this is not mine. <laughs> I guess this is uh, Dr. Kathy Erevins, but she sort of explains it with these you know, radiation for imaging. So X-ray, UV, IR are the ones that can actually help us identify certain types of pigments. Like UV is pretty helpful when you're uh, looking at uh, UV reflective uh, ones and what is called multi-spectral -spe uh, imaging te technology, I guess, uh, is used to so using these different different imaging methods of like using different uh, light rays and how the, the painted surface re respond to these uh, different light rays actually can, and, and how they actually show, uh, can help us understand what's on the surface. So these are some of these, tech, some of these techniques, uh, mostly non-destructive. Although the first one, uh, the FTIR, Vernier Transfer Infrared, that actually is going to be needing some sample because it actually is, uh, I guess need to take a sample to vibrate under this uh, ray, infrared ray to kind of get the excited uh, responses from the elements. But a lot of the sort of poor mineral and sort of inorganic material, X-ray fluorescence is really excellent because it actually sort of all these elemental uh, elements actually respond to X-ray fluorescence and you get different peaks. And that's how, so when, when, what I was showing you in the presentation, most of them were XRF chart. And then there is also Raman spectroscopy that also gets a different sort of, you know, spectrum of responses from the pigment. And there is also fiber optic uh, fluorescent uh, spectroscopy that actually uses, again, different light rays and its responses. And that, so Raman and uh, fiber optic technology can actually help us sort of, you know, understand the, uh, what is it? more of an organic material because in comparison to the spectrum of other, so you have a reference, the reference database of the material of sort of, of these, you know, uh, reference material for these graphs. And then you can compare your own to these uh, reference materials. And these reference materials and scientific analysis of pigments, uh, all these sort of uh, data is actually available on Cameo website. There is a uh, the I, I I hope there is a link somewhere uh, that you can actually always go check it out if you are curious about you know oh what is an orpiment or you know, what what do they when they say a tekanite what is that uh, you can actually look it up and and find out uh, what they are. So these are the tech sort of some of the analytical techniques that are used and of course there is I mean it start with. These anal analysis actually start with visible light sort of examination. Like um, the first step is examining it in person and you know what the the, the just actual object, and then um, and then with different light rays. So uh, that's how that goes. Mm -hmm. And it's it is like really involved uh, collaboration. If you sort of uh, you can see from when I'm trying to tell you, I'm no scientist, but I just now like learned to read some of these data. So I am. Uh... You know, that is, a fa it is a wonderful, wonderful tool to have even as a collaborative um, re research. I mean, related to that, how do you think, how accurate are the results in the sense that we know that there's such a history of overpainting in Indian painting and right. uh, retouching, sometimes removing, adding, and in that sense, how how does that how does this uh, method work? Right. No. So because you know scientific analysis does. So when I first went to the scientists to ask about these sort of 
you know, objects and their pigments, I thought I'll just get answer like, you know, the candy popping out of machine, but that's not the case. I've learned, you know, uh, that scientists really takes this very, very seriously that, you know, it's going to be every step of the way is going to be interpretation. And I mean, even just today, like uh, Dr. Michelle Derrick and I were sort of kind of comparing notes about, is there really uh, lead present in that painting? Cause there is a, you know, there might be a lead peak in that XRF data. And I, I said, well, that's a 13th century painting. You can't have a lead. Like, I, I don't think there should be lead. And she sort of reread the data and she said, well, no, actually, I, I don't think that's actually red peak. So you know, it, it is sort of back and forth and, you know, it, it is an interpretive um, you know, process. And, you know, you uh, also have, when you see on the surface, and that's why we have microscopic analysis. You know, you do see on the surface, you need to actually see the surface as well to see like what the layers are. And when you see something like chrome yellow come up in a like 14th century painting, then you know this is something not right. And you then examine the surface and you kind of see what the layers are. So often when there is a loss, uh, you can tell if there is, uh, you know, the you know overpainting and so it actually these kind of analysis help us to understand the overpainting and and sort of later restoration. So there is a 15th century painting that we have analyzed that uh, you know uh, it seems to have a later restoration, probably 20th century restoration that had like surprising number of uh, pigments that are in there. It seems to have potentially a several possible uh, uh, sort of functions that this sort of uh, uh, project could potentially have, not only in figuring out uh, added layers later on, but also right. perhaps even uh, figuring out regions from which these works might have been made, perhaps. And uh, also in terms of particular pigments, because once again, as when, when we were being taught the technique, the only white I knew was zinc white. <laughs> and then I later on found out that that's a European introduction, maybe late 18th century or something. But then as I was reading your book, it seems like maybe that's not the case. Could you talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, no. So, I mean, the, the prominent usage of zinc white is understood to be sort of like after 18th century introduction, like, um, and when you see zinc appearing in sort of earlier material, people think this is like later alteration. But uh, this was actually observation by Dr. Sonia uh, Lee Mace at the Cleveland Museum of Art, where she said to me, at least, uh, that you know, zinc smelting and zinc has been around the whole time. Like I mean, from very early on in ancient uh, South Asia, so. And it's, it's been used in Ayurveda and, you know, you, you, you do have a like early usage of zinc in India and it might not be like too out of bound to imagine that there was actually like attempt to use zinc white as, cause it, it's been used in cosmetics and medicine in sort of ancient South Asia. So it's possible that it actually might have been used uh, by the native artists before this commercial production in uh, factories in Europe. And I, I do think that's actually an important sort of insight. And because we don't have a baseline data for, that's why I'm actually doing this project. We want a lot more data to actually think about where you can actually find these. And what, maybe we need to actually sort of question our assumptions about when these things get introduced uh, because we don't know much. And actually the, the use of the sort of cobalt uh, base blue, like smalt, for example, it is believed to be like 18th century introduction or like 17th century introduction, let's say. Uh, but you do have some cobalt base blue that's appearing in like, let's say 15th century manuscript, mm. then is this a later alteration? Or is it possible that you actually had the cobalt based blue used in South Asia that we just didn't know about? And uh, the, this reference spectrum for 
cobalt blue for the material that's because certain re reference spectrum can be traced back to even certain factory, right? So you do have uh, what type, you know, where certain pigment came from. And this, the right now, we don't know, but I think the comparison between the 15th century cobalt based blue versus the sort of 17th century cobalt based blue, the spectrum seems to be different in terms of its composition. So, which indicates it's possible it is native production. So that's why I'm doing this project and actually like seeking a lot of collaboration with a lot of other institutions to really get more baseline data. Because I think we just, I mean, a lot about pigments are sort of known from European and sort of Western art canon. So this is why I'm like really committed to doing this, really looking at a lot more South Asian and Himalayan materials because just we don't have a lot to go on in terms of baseline data. Yeah, and I, I just uh, I got a message also from uh, from one of our. Uh, uh, that Jawar in Rajasthan was producing zinc since the 14th century, and Deborah Stein's essay addresses this as well. So that's also yeah, uh, no, no, fascinating. <laughs> Absolutely, like zinc's been around, and yeah. And so. also with that point that you're making, that uh, it's almost like uh, trying to flip the trend uh, and and try to so as you say in the book as well, trying to get a sort of emic. Uh, approach from within the tradition itself. And it seems like the potential uh, mapping color in history, your uh, uh, digital humanities project, it yeah. will have a long lasting uh, impact on that. Uh, could you well, talk a little bit about that? So, well, I mean, I, I hope so, but it's also, you know, the digital humanities project is uh, as good as the data that one can get. So if I don't get a lot of collaboration from all these like different institutions who are guardians of uh, these objects, you know, it's a moot point. So <laughs> I like need a lot of people to work together. And so the hope is, I mean, currently we're the, the digital humanities project has actually three sides. Uh, one is art historical research. The other one is conservation or scientific research. And the third is this digital asset and digital database development. So this like the all these three need to go together for this to work. And we just now kind of coming to to wrap around the second stage of sort of database model and, and asset development. So we do have a sort of a system where you can start mapping these objects and kind of see them in the, a systematic way. But mapping especially mapping the objects from South Asia, pre-modern South Asia becomes such a challenge that, you know, often you will find something like, yeah, 17th century maybe, or, you know, 17th through 18th century, maybe North India, you know, it's like, where do you put that on the map? So it gets so tricky if you have an object that's like so orphaned. And that's where we do a lot of artistic research and then, it's also kind of there is an arbitrariness in assigning these things, but at the end of the day, we want to map them. So we kind of, I mean, I have been telling my research assistants and graduate students that I'm working with uh, that we need to let, let's do more research to at least come down to a state, maybe a district, if, if not like a, a city, so we can actually start mapping them. And that's been a challenge. Uh, and also dating. So that, I mean, all of that. And coming, with, coming up with control vocabulary for this database has been also quite a huge challenge actually. So I'm hoping I will actually convene a workshop or, or, or kind of, you know, where art historians working on South Asian painting can come together, really debate on certain key issues of con control vocabulary. So that's also another challenge that I'm looking into so going forward. But again, like this database to work, I need like inputs from a lot of people. Yeah, yeah and in a post partition context with repositories divided. Yeah, yeah. Borders also. Yeah, no, no. So I mean, I'm hoping I can get data from, you know, everywhere. But uh, the access to museums here has been quite useful because they, uh, you know, there is a ready made basically 
you know, easy access to labs and the the not easy access, but everyone's willingness to help has been. I'm I'm just super grateful for everyone to actually uh, for helping me to understand this. And it's not a simple task to do any analysis and analytical study on each object takes a long while. And uh, and interpreting that data for art historical research also takes a while. So all that I'm hoping to sort of achieve with this uh, project. Yeah. Well, that's uh, really looking forward to that project coming to life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hoping I'm hoping we can go live with the database uh, soon, but I, I think it, there are still quite a lot of uh, glitches. So it's, uh, we will see. I, I'm, I, it's coming together quite well, but I, I, I and I'm hoping we can actually go live with it uh, soon. And maybe uh, another time I will show you how it works. And mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, we could, I could go on asking more sort of have it continuing with this conversation, um, unless we have any questions from the audience. Uh, ni yeah, ni I, um, yeah, we, we do have a couple and thank you so much, Ina and Mara. This is fantastic. And um, we've had, I, I think some of the questions that our audience had, you were kind of answering along the way, which was fantastic. Um, but we did, uh, I mean, there's just, I think a lot of excitement um, in the sort of chat and conversation just about the database and just an eagerness to sort of know more how to get involved. Um, someone's asking what platform you're using for hosting the mapping color database. I think that's a quick question for you, Gina. Platform meaning, I mean, so the database is going to be, let's see, their hosting site. Like, so there is a hosting server. The server is like Amazon. Like, it's just like, <laughs> but this is uh, the database itself is like modeled and designed from scratch. So that's why it has been a sort of. When I first proposed this project, I thought it would be like quick thing that there is some sort of platform that I can plug in and actually just start collecting data. It turns out there isn't. So we had to start from scratch and actually design the database model and, and then go on to build it. And, and database model modeling and also making the asset that can actually take this kind of data takes a, a lot of resources and a lot of coding. I've, I mean, I don't know the code language, but I'm just sitting in meetings with these, uh, you know, programmers and coders and learning about them. It's quite mind boggling what, what you see behind the scene of these fancy websites. So yeah, I, I guess, um, I don't know if that answers. I mean, you, you think this would be a very simple question to ask, but it's uh, not actually. That's when I went in, I thought I would just have it, you know, oh, it would be great if I can actually sort of have all this data come together and see them historically. That was my motivation actually to start this because I have learned a lot about pigments and the learning about a lot of scientific analysis being done. And I wanted to compare and see the trend and kind of compare them appearing where they appear and how they appear and you know see if one can actually find different trends and where those changes happen the first. So these things I wanted to actually sort of study more and the easy way to combine and compare this data, I wanted to find a way and I've been using sort of Excel sheet basically, like like really, really long spreadsheet, like really, really long spreadsheet. And it's kind of hard to see and you know, they're all there, but spreadsheets are not an easy way to do your sort of historical research. And I wanted to see them mapped. So uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing now, I guess. Thanks so much, Gina. That's great. Um, we have a few questions. Um, actually, both like some questions about the color blue in particular. Um, one of which is, I mean, about sort of uh, the cost. I mean, you talked about Gina, um, the lapis lazuli. You know that pre that precious material. Um, someone's asking, you know, how does cost come into play in Asia when when choosing color? So there may be a question here about the economics um, and how what what can we know about the economics of of uh, color, um, sort of historically. And I would say even it might be interesting to think about this in the contemporary moment too. And I'm thinking about you, Murad, 
as a contemporary practitioner of painting, um, you know, how, how in the sort of adaptation of this tradition into the contemporary moment, does this sort of, you know, translation of traditional materials get carried forward? Where are we seeing maybe a, um, a, di a division sort of a di separation from that? Um, and actually someone's also asking about uh, maybe just a reiteration of, you know, is there a way to see if the material uh, being used for blue is lapis lazuli or indigo, you know, just maybe sort of a kind of just re re reiterating some of that, Gina, um, of how, you know, how is, how do we, how do, how is that being seen exactly? So, well, I mean, now I know to actually look for granular, if you have sort of like, you know, magnifying glass, even just like any magnifying glass, you can tell if there is a grain, granular sort of texture to the, the color. It is most likely mineral base, whether lapis lazuli or azurite or some other mineral base versus indigo is often very smooth. It doesn't have that granular quality. So even just magnifying glass, that would be like first off like bet that you can kind of tell. Um, so that's that. But in terms of economy of color, that's a question I want to know and answer, but I really don't have a lot of answers to. And I'm hoping this mapping color and history project can actually show like certain preference and, and prevalence of certain colors and like what one can tell about economy from that. I'm sort of, you know, I'm curious myself <laughs> to find out because we don't have a lot of records about sort of, you know, amount of money that was given to, uh, painters in response to what they have done, right? But in terms of appearance of gold, for example, like gold does get used and sometimes it's scantily used, sometimes it's heavily used, you know that's going to be, it's gold by like weight. So you, you do know that's going to have had some really, you know, uh, expensive sponsor or like, or, or a wealthy sponsor doing the, uh, commissioning or imperial workshops that you have such, such diversity of color palette, then you know that they had access to like precious materials along with new pigments. So early Mughal workshop works uh, like even Akbar's atelier seem to have had a you know, sort of diversifying palette that they, they had access to different types of pigments it seems than what was pos possible in the area of Delhi uh, in the 16th century. So in comparison to things that are made in like non mughal context of sort of similar time period, the Mughal Imperial Workshop definitely had resources that had access to, including access to precious materials and including Indian yellow. So that would be something that will tell us about kind of economy of preciousness of materials that are used. So when you have gold and silver and ultramarine and azurite, I guess you can tell that, but ultramarine versus azurite, I think azurite is more common material. So in terms of value of like or rare, rarity, so you do see, I think azurite kind of replacing ultramarine, not replacing, but I think azurite does get used more. But I would love to hear what Murat has to say about the contemporary practice, actually, how the <laughs> pigment like, pricing goes. <laughs> but it's interesting because as when I was being taught the technique at the National College of Arts in Lahore, we weren't really taught how to use uh, natural pigments, uh, except for zinc white. That was the only uh, pigment that we used. And I, uh, it's interesting how uh, the idea of making a larger palette uh, was by mixing zinc white with every color. And that's something that you also mentioned in the book, Hai, how one of these particular uh, texts mentioned that of sort of expanding the palette by using, I think it's lead, lead white, I think historically. So it's a sort of similar process that in every uh, normal watercolor that could, could be any watercolor factory made, you just add zinc white to create, give it opacity and then make lots mm -hmm. of grades. But once I started to do my own research and started to incorporate natural pigments into my own practice, I realized that you can find most of these pigments that you mentioned uh, in the uh, sort of local, uh, uh, what would be an equivalent to the Ayurvedic type shops. Mm -hmm. 
in in Pakistan, it's more to do with the 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 Greek Yunani medicine, but it's right Yunani medicine, yeah. But it's the same idea because you find cinnabar and vermilion and malachite and lapis in all the uh, sort of druggists or chemical uh, the chemists stores that would then outsource to the local uh, uh, hakims or the people who practice Yunani medicine, right. and that's where the the all the source for all these pigments for me still is actually. No, see, I mean, that's actually a really interesting observation, like interesting sort of anecdotal experience to report because I think there is a close like relationship between like medicine and art that, or artistic practice that our science science and art that the pigments, like and sort of experimenting with pigments and kind of coming up with recipes really kind of went together with, let's say like Ayurvedic medicine or what's developing in Sort of scientific experiments that go into sort of Ayurvedic uh, medicine. So there's definitely very close relationship. And when you start looking for what kind of materials were used and in that region, you often have to kind of go to these medical texts or scientific texts to mm -hmm. see if they were actually discussing these materials as and usage and their usage. And in terms of white, I have to say actually. Before 16th century, a lot of white is actually calcite or clay white. So we don't see lead-based pigments, at least for manuscript paintings uh, before, like on palm leaf. That's why I was talking about this. Are you sure that's the, you know, lead peak? Because that date doesn't seem to be right for lead. And, and you know, she, she came back. I mean, it's possible that it's a lead you know, add it later or something. But, um, and she came back saying like, yeah, like I, I think you're right. That actually is not a red, red pick. So uh, anyway, so white uh, for somehow pre, you know, 1500 materials, it seems is clay white or calcite or calcium based uh, white. And it does stay that way for areas that are you know, like Malwa material that I've shown, it's actually still using clay white, uh, not lead white. And lead white and lead based material actually also has changed in color <clears throat> in response to like oxidization and such. So. In the Pahadi region in the foothills of the Himalayas, they still, uh, they don't, I don't think they use lead white even now. It's mostly, I think it's either uh, some sort of clay white or uh, some uh, uh, sort of stone related white, I think, because that's it has a sort of creamier uh, texture to it. It's that's not a sort of brilliant uh, white, which is interesting. It's fascinating. Um, I we have maybe a a question that I think is is interesting to follow from from this discussion about actually the the preparation of pigments, and I I think there's so many different types of pigments and their sources that we're talking about here, right? The kind of chemical, the natural, I mean, I'm thinking of indigo, you know, that sort of the sourcing or even harvesting of the plant. Um, someone is asking, you know, is the, the pigment making, you know, of course, like the grinding and preparation, but even this kind of chemical sort of processing, um, would that have happened outside or within the Tuscarana? And were, was it maybe different from different material to material? Um, they're asking, you know, was it overseen by the head artist um, or, you know, was the distribution of labor between painters and, and actual color, color makers? And I guess I'm, I'm curious to Murad in the context of what you're saying about, um, you know, these materials being used in Ayurveda, you know, wh what, like where does that connection happen and between in every case between sort of the workshop and other other sources that we might see and yeah I, I think that's a, that's a big question but <laughs> maybe different for different things but curious what you might be able to you know just elaborate a little more on that. Gina? Well so for historical material it's hard to tell like what the process was in terms of you know how pigments were made and produced and actually used some I think was readily made, like av readily available material might have been just be gotten from the resources around, but when it's actually more professionalized like workshops, like imperial workshops, I think they did have access to already traded pigments. Like, so I'm assuming these actually are coming. So when we say pigments, we're talking about this material that can be then ground to be used, right? So there is still the grinding process 
you're not going to find the opium in the nature and like, you know, quarry that rock and use it. There is somebody who's quarrying the rock and making into like purified foam that's, you know, kind of a, a consolidated foam that is being traded is my assumption actually. But we don't know is the, the right answer that we don't know how that process went. But I think uh, from the, when there are a lot of natural material being used, I mean, I don't think indigo can be just made by a group of, uh, you know, family. It's, it's a labor intensive process. It's gotta be having like, you know, sort of traded and, and uh, sort of commercially transactioned uh, all the, what is, what's a commodity rather than something that can be just made at home. So that's my uh, understanding and assumption, I guess, but that is to be explored further actually. And I mean, I didn't write a book about pigment recipes because that was so hard for, especially for a period before um, early modern era. And you know, the text, what they, they are telling when try to re you know, recreate this kind of recipe, a lot of terminologies are also the interpretation of what these terms actually mean can differ from period to period. So it's hard to tell. I mean, it's like the cookbook recipe from Mandu Sultan's uh, Nimat Name, where if you try to create that recipe based on that like, you know, 15th century recipe, it's not gonna, it doesn't sound so tasty actually to our <laughs> taste buds. <laughs> Maybe something needs to be translated, right? Anyway, so. But Murad, I know you actually do prepare a lot of things yourself, uh, right? Yeah, and I constantly come across so many challenges mm -hmm. as well because I now realize that it's not a one person job at all. And it makes me also realize that it was really a communal, a community uh, job, just like thinking about the traditional medicine makers and those who were outsourcing their wares to the medicine, uh, to the doctors. Uh, must have also been providing certain elements, even if raw material to the workshop, uh, uh, perhaps, or the dying community, like, uh, you know, uh, who, who must, might have been dying pigments like uh, indigo, maybe there was this, so I, I can see that there must have been so many networks at play in a pre-colonial context, uh, or maybe even are now in some certain ways, uh, because so many pigments have to be outsourced, uh, so like you talk about vermilion, which doesn't even, is not even available in South Asia, and yet it's one of the most important pigments for making. Uh, right, right. Yeah, I mean, things like red ochre, uh, I think was actually readily available thing, that there is a passage uh, that I cite in um, the book of, uh, you know, just like a, a prince fetching his uh, confidant to go like get my get me this like red earth stone I'm gonna draw right go to, go to the hill go to the hill and just get me some red stone I'm gonna draw with it whereas I guess a few yeah think about vermilion although the the findings at Ajanta where you have actually green colorant being sort of green earth that's also locally available do tell us where you have like big workshop probably working at the site and they were kind of utilizing locally available resources. So that there we do know green color there is actually using a, a specific type of green rock that's available, egregious rock uh, formation that's available at the site. So probably, you know, grinding those. But as I said, grinding does need to happen even if you were getting already traded pigments. So, mm. and different pigments have different binding agents because if it's a it's a more heavy uh, uh, pigment, then perhaps gum arabic does not really hold it. Then you have to use animal bone glue or some other sort of mm -hmm. uh, material that binds more more heavier pigments. So everything has its own uh, nature, of course. So there's no sort right. of one size fits all when we're making a pigments. It's it's quite a elaborate, complicated. <laughs> process. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, we have a, a, someone was asking very specifically about the the lavender color that we see in some of the images and what material that's from. Well, I mean, so that's what I was always curious about. What is this purplish color? And I think often what we have found is it's actually sort of 
whatever white is used with the organic red. So it's often organic material. So most likely matter or lock dye, but it's likely matter is, uh, and there are some uh, fiber, fiber optic sort of analysis one can do to read that what type of organic red it is, but it's most likely it's organic red with sort of whatever white is used, either lead white or zinc white even <laughs> for very late materials. And these sort of options that you're talking about of either this or that also really, I guess that's like a running theme across your book also is about the idea of the uh, agency of the artist <laughs> right. to shed a sort of fascinating light onto that as well, the choices that the artists ha could make. I, I just wanted to give them some credit, I guess, because <laughs> we don't have their names in right. most cases. So a lot of cases, we don't have names. So I wanted to give them credit because I think there is like inventiveness in using these materials in certain ways. So. Mm -hmm. We have a, no, a few more questions if you guys are willing to just stay a few more um, minutes. I so we we have um, we have a few more questions also about uh, about pigments, but I, I might want to turn us for, to a few questions that are a little bit more about kind of the digital humanity project. Um, someone um, is asking. They say one of the things I've been grappling and working with digital humanities tools is to think about the art historical way of interpretation and the difficulty of translating it into a d digital humanities mode of analysis. And they're asking, Gina, how have you know have you had to deal with this, and and do you have any advice? Oh yeah, daily. <laughs> I don't have a good answer to it, other than really need to be kind of persistent and rigorous about, and yet, so this was a challenge when we, I, I went in to actually talk to the digital, like uh, asset developing people, like, or even like talking to data scientists about how I'm going to do this. And of, this data is very fragmentary. The data I'm working with is completely like very, you know, I want to capture very gran granular data. I want to capture, I don't want to simplify. I don't want to really just generalize. I want to be able to capture all these very, very nitty gritty like detail information. And how do I do that? And that's how we went down the rabbit hole and actually you know, trying to come up with a new model and, and come up with a way to kind of organize this information. So the, I mean, I don't think we have, I, there's no perfect solution for this. And I just, one needs to just keep trying to make it uh, that it is historically grounded. But as I said, historically grounding this is a huge challenge because we just don't have a lot of information on these objects. So it's, I mean, sometimes it's just becomes so arbitrary and, and I, I, you know, when I'm like agonizing over where to put Malwa painting on a map, because I don't know exactly where this was from. And there are some candidates and I need to just come up with a geographic location. I just was so tempted to just, can I just, you know, put Malwa Plateau and just, you know, have it fixed later because <laughs> I, I want to map it on the, on the database but I cannot come up with an actually fixed point. So this is going to be a, a constant negotiation and challenge. And, and whoever comes to use this database also needs to know there is, I mean, this, this is, there are some decisions that are being made in the background and also on the like foreground that one can see that this is not perfect. It's going to be like constantly reiterated and changed. And I'm like, the, what's actually great about the modeling here is we can change things. It's not fixed. It's always, you know, if the research shows something needs to be like, the date needs to change or the data needs to change or it being updated in it, it can. And also it also documents analytical data in sort of chronological sequence. So an object can could have been analyzed in 1960s and it was analyzed yesterday. We have more than one an, an analysis done on an object and it gets sort of documented. And you can also tell what kind of methodology was used and in like you know 1960s versus 2017. So that kind of changing sort of, you know, sort of methods and analytical data points are all being updated. But this is also 
a lot of uh, a lot of time, like a lot of people's time actually going into this to make it work. So it it I mean I think staying nimble and actually being able to re like it it's an iterative process. It's not going to have like one size fits all answer is now I'm understanding the digital humanities sort of project to be that it's going to be just evolving monster that I'm trying to tame. Absolutely, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing project. Um, I, I think this, uh, this question is a little related to what you were just saying, Gina, but someone's asking if there are, there are instances where the scientific analysis you know, can qualify a date for an object and, and whether, you know, it could actually show if it was fake, uh, for example. Um, and someone was also asking a question, like a more general question about like what reasons were were older works um, repainted or copied? I know Murad, you, your class is attending to that very question. Um, but, you know, just curious if that's come up for you, Gina, and, and, and or if that's even, you know, interesting in the, sort of analysis is also sort of the dating of, of objects that might be in collections as well. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I think, so I mean, this was a question I think uh, someone had asked at the Christie's as well, that people were at, like curious if these sort of, you know, analytical data points actually point to some things being fake, but what does that mean? What is a fake actually? And I, I think it's, I, if something uses like really modern pigment, it's a modern painting, like in the style of whatever. So I don't really consider it as, I mean, I will, if we have an object that actually entered this uh, database that actually has all the 21st century pigments, let's say jet black or, you know, what is it? Ani Anish Kapoor's like black this, uh, <laughs> is on it, you know, we'll record it in the style of Pari painting, let's say. So it it's, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be uh, sort of whether we're going to determine a fake or not, but it's, uh, there are timelines and one can tell, that's why I was saying we, we can tell a risk restoration of the 20th century versus a 15th century sort of layer because it's sort of the pigments that they use are different. And and sometimes the object got messed with in a way that, you know, that it makes it actually harder to analyze. Uh, there is a painting in Har the Harvard Art Museum that uh, the scientist, uh, uh, Dr. Kathy Aramin told me, it has like tin all over it. It's so hard to read the data because somebody like, you know, did something on it that has tin all over it and that like, interferes with the analysis. So uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it, there is a way to date certain things, but it's not going to be, again, this whole thing is interpretation and iterative process rather than, you know, you put A and like B comes out as, as an answer. So that's like one huge lesson that I've been learning that you know, it's all about interpretation, all about taking the time and like willing to accept like the, the differences as possibilities. I don't know, Murad, if you wanted to say anything about even the practice, I mean, the very important practice of, of copying in this tradition. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's such a, on one level, such a uh, conservative practice historically that the whole way you learn and you can spend years and years learning is through making copies. You know, the, culturally, it's understood that there was some master artist who perfected a particular art form or a particular line or a particular style, and then that needs to be learned and copied and copied and copied. And so, which is why we have, or certain symbols or certain expressions become so popular across regions that they get repeated and copied and spread across different patrons and schools. So uh, it's so much part of uh, the language, uh, you know, and, and it's so similar to other art forms, traditional art forms as well, whether that's classical music or uh, classical dance, you have to master a given art form before you can explore it uh, further. So during that mastering, you end up having so many copies of particular styles or artworks or themes. That's one reason. And then there, of course, there, I'm sure there are many others as well for that uh, copying. <laughs> yeah, that's great.
great. I know we're, we're kind of coming to the end of time and there are so many good questions and comments. Um, I just wanna kind of give voice to a few of them and maybe um, as we wind down, you can sort of pick and choose. Um, we did have the, uh, some really kind of beautiful commentary and, and thinking um, from one of our attendees about sort of the connections also between um, some of these works that we're talking about and also Persian Injuid paintings of the 14th century um, and sort of other regions as well. And the question here and sort of comment was also thinking um, or turning to Gina to ask, you know, does this project, might, and might it now, can it in the future, include testing of manuscripts with shared colored palettes across Hindu and Jain as well as Islamic courts? Um, and is there a possibility to work with museums in wider America and in Europe in order to test a larger body of manuscripts, which um, a great question. And I guess related also to kind of the methodology or opportunities of the project, um, someone else was also asking about um, to what extent can pigment or production of a historical object be elucidated even in some modest way by ethnographic work with artist communities today. Um, they gave the example of painters of Pichuai or even um, textile dyers. Um, saying in Kutch today, artisan communities, skills in textile, bronze work, and other aesthetic production can be found. Um, so those sort of were, were some. Um, I want to also uh, just throw out actually a kind of a different question that maybe we can get to. Also, uh, just going back to kind of the symbolism of color. Uh, someone was asking, you know, what are kind of the art historical implications or um, of the different color use, for example, does the use of the same blue for a Krishna figure, uh, as well as the sky, make some kind of sort of um, interpretive connection? Can we, and maybe can we glean that? So those are a few of the wonderful questions that are left. Um, I don't think we'll get to everything, but I, I put those out and if there's something you wanna say about any of those. Well, the so digital humanities project that I'm working on, the so I, I said I start with South Asian materials, but the ambition is to really, I mean, the database modeling, I, I told the team from the beginning that it should be expendable chronologically, geographically in any direction. So if anyone is willing to share the data, we'll take it. And we're actually looking at uh, sort of taking the data from ukiyo-e analysis of uh, Museum of Fine Art Boston. So, uh, they have done a lot of uh, pigment analysis or dye and color analysis uh, on ukiyo-e sort of prints, and we're hoping one could sort of incorporate that. And and anyone who has sort of already been doing a lot of nautical studies, I'm like you know asking to contribute. And we're also taking data from sort of already published studies. So that was my mandate that it should be able to take the studies that's already published and already existing and ongoing studies and future studies. So that uh, is sort of kind of part of the design. And yeah, of course it should be able to take all this in consideration. And uh, in terms of the color symbolism, but there was another question before color symbolism. I don't remember. <laughs> there was this question about uh, testing manuscripts with shared color palette colored palettes across sort of Indic and Islamic gate sort of courts and possibility to work in wider, in museums in wider America and in Europe in order to test a larger body of manuscripts. But Gina, there was also a question about sort of ethnographic work. Which... Oh, right, right. Yeah, ethnographic work, I think that has really informed a lot of my understanding actually. So that will continue and I'm hoping I will continue to learn from these sort of ethnographic research that's being done and also just learning from the artists. And I always love to just go talk to artists about their process. So uh, that is just the side of research that will keep sort of informing our understanding of the historical material. That is, uh, I, I'm committed to sort of continuing that, although that's actually is not reflected in the database in terms of form of, as a, as a form of data. It's just the interpretive sort of frame that that kind of understanding gives is reflected in our interpretation. And in terms of the sort of comparison across these different sort of religious sort of you know, um, communities, it is possible to compare wh whichever way because this database does not discriminate against any religious background. So this is really 
just open to all <laughs> database. So you can find what you're looking for if we have the data for. Uh, and uh, right, so that's that. And the symbolism, I think there is a lot of sort of, especially Krishna and blue and you know, let's say sky color. There are a lot of poetics that, that that's why I brought in Bihari uh, Lal's you know, poem or, or couplet that I, I think there is a lot of sort of poetic and, and devotional songs that kind of make the symbolic connections. And I'm sure one can do a deeper study on this color symbolism and you know how the pigment usage also changed. And like in, uh, you can actually contextualize uh, this sort of symbolism by looking at painting and pigment usage, hopefully <laughs> is my hope. And Murad, I mean, I'd love to know, Murad, I mean, in your own painting work and sort of in contemporary work that calls on this tradition, is that something, that kind of symbolic use of color, is that something that you're thinking about as well? Not, I mean, I'm thinking about contemporary miniaturist practice that is happening, for example, in Pakistan. I don't think that is as many of those sort of links between literature, for example, and uh, painting or between uh, devotional cultures and painting have been sort of broken down and you know other associations have emerged so it's not a sort of that uh, awareness I don't think exists in the same way in as it would in a historical context I think. But I think artists actually now has a freedom to come up with their own symbolism That's in a it. way that you know is in response to the new context and mm -hmm. You know, it's like learning from the history, but also creating the new meaning and new sort of system of your own. I think that's what artistic agency and like artists as with free will can do today. Exactly. Exactly. Unlike in pre-modern South Asia or you know pre-colonial South Asia, where a lot of like things were dictated in a way, and artists were kind of cleverly na navigating, trying to come up with certain ways to do things. Right? Oh yeah, it's completely opened up in that sense. And there's so many more global interactions as well uh, yeah. in, in sort of more nuanced ways that have made a more subjective interpretation of one's own practices and culture possible. Yeah, maybe you will come up with like your own white symbolism, right? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, so I think maybe we just we, we should sort of turn to wrapping up. Um, this has been amazing, and um, you know I, I think we've gotten through like <laughs> fifteen questions. We have a, still a few more that might be outstanding. I'm sorry if we didn't get to to yours. Um, but just to close, I mean we had a, we just had a few questions just about like resources and where you can see both like you know works like the ones we're talking about today. Um, Certainly, it's someone from the region was asking, and I know the Williams College Museum of Art does have a strong collection. But um, you know, Gina and Murad, I'd love to hear if there are other regional, you know, in I mean, and Harvard as well, of course. But like, if there are others and other collections in the region that you think are really strong to that people could have access to. And um, in addition, someone's just asking about um, like an online source like specific to listing the colors and the pigments that you're that we're discussing and I actually thought maybe Jeannie you could just say a little more maybe about the Harvard pigment lab and um just you know resources of that kind oh yeah no there is a Harvard Art Museum's like Strauss Center like pigment material is actually all digital uh, digitized and you can actually search for those pigments um uh, the Strauss Center material is actually you can I think keyword search Strauss Center to come up with uh, all the forest pigment collection that we have. Like on the fourth floor of the Harvard Art Museum, there is a like, uh, wonderful pigment collection that, uh, I mean, in the days before COVID, there, you could even get a tour of, you need to, you need to sign up for it uh, when it's uh, available. But I guess, hopefully that will happen again <laughs> at some point. And in terms of you know Indian painting or South Asian painting collection, Harvard does have a big collection of South Asian paintings. I mean, I know Williams College Museum of Art has a phenomenal collection. And of course, Museum of Fine Arts Boston has a phenomenal collection. And I think Worcester Art Museum also has a, a quite a strong South Asian art collection. And I guess not really old, Older material, pre-modern material is not as strong, but Peabody Access Museum also has a pretty good South Asian holdings. So more of a modern contemporary materials, but still 
think those are the places that in the region you can go to. See. Amherst, the, the Mead has a uh, collection as well. Oh, great. That's great, yeah. That's more than, than I knew. That's fantastic. Well, I, I really just want to thank um, you both so much for this, Gina, your amazing work. We're so excited to follow along and continue to, to watch this um, this project thank grow you. and develop. And, and Murad, thank you for everything, for your amazing work and um, your amazing conversation. And um, we hope that you know we'll all continue to be in touch. And a huge thank you also to our audience today for in your incredible engagement. So many amazing questions. I, I think we could have got, probably gone another hour into this really incredible, fascinating topic. But um, I do just want to also say that um, for anyone who is interested in learning more, uh, the Tatsburkana exhibition that's up at the Williams College Museum of Art um, is all digital uh, and digitally accessible. And actually, Murad has been recording amazing content that's actually been for his class, um, all about kind of the process and the practice. And those videos are available on our website. I, um, I think we have a link in the chat to that. Um, but it, it is a really rich resource. You can go really deep <laughs> if you'd like. Um, and of course, many, many resources, um, which we hope to collect and also send out in the follow-up email tomorrow. But um, just so much thanks to you, Murad and Gina. It's just such a pleasure to, to be here with you both. Thank oh, thank you, so you for hosting us. Yes. Thank you. Great pleasure. Well, I hope everyone um, takes care. This is a hard week and for many and uh, so just so grateful to have everyone here. Um, thank you for your beautiful questions and the beautiful answers, Gina and Rod. Um, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Hey. <laughs>